Crisscrossing the Buckeye State, I've explored charming villages and bustling cities, but one town stands out in my memory, shrouded in an unsettling aura that still sends shivers down my spine. Nestled amidst Ohio's picturesque landscapes, this seemingly ordinary town harbors secrets that whisper of darkness and unease. Join me as I recount my chilling encounter with the most unsettling place in Ohio. We have the Blue Flame Ghost. The story goes that in the 1930s, a woman lived in Ohio's Sugar Grove. She was young, happy, and liked by everyone. She fell for a young man who had a terrible temper, and the couple were often seen arguing in the town. Over time, the locals noticed her changing. She never smiled anymore and began to grow cold and weary. One night, the couple were parked beside a bridge when, naturally, an argument broke out. This time, it was worse than usual, though. In a fit of anger, the young woman pulled out a knife and stabbed her fiancé's throat. She kept slashing until his head came off. She herself was bleeding from the struggle. She staggered out of the car and back down the hill, carrying her fiancé's head. She eventually collapsed and died at the bottom of the hill, where she was found by locals the next day. Since then, the old bridge has been replaced by a new concrete one. However, some still say that on certain nights, if you stand on the bridge and call out the woman's name, her glowing blue spirit will appear at the top of the hill and move towards you. What you do at that point is honestly up to you, but given the vengeful state in which she died, most people don't stick around. Next up at number 9 now, we have the Defiance Werewolf. This is a very famous one. The people of Defiance in Ohio have claimed that for the past 45 years or so, they've been terrorized by a werewolf. It was first sighted in 1972. Over the summer, there were many sightings of a rampaging, hair-covered beast on two legs. It was said to have a muzzle and was always covered in rags. The local media went into a frenzy, and even the police opened up a case file on the sightings. There have been many sightings since then. Many of them were around a series of old railroad tracks in the town, usually late at night. One of the first sightings was by a Mr. Davis. Now he said, I was connecting an air hose between two cars and was looking down. I saw these huge hairy feet. Then I looked up and he was standing there with that big stick over his shoulder. When I started to say something, he took off for the woods. His friend, Mr. Jones, was with him at the time. He said, at first I thought the whole thing was a big joke. When I saw how hairy and woolly it was, that was enough for me. Next up at number 8 now, we have Brubaker Bridge. According to legend, in the 1930s, there was a brutal one-car accident on this bridge over Sam's Run Creek, Butler County. The bridge is in a very rural area, and nobody actually discovered the crash victims until later that night, when a local farmer passed by. The farmer went to get help, and a total of 12 bodies were recovered. They were eventually identified and given proper burials. That wasn't the end of things though. Shortly after, the farmer who originally discovered the bodies claimed that while crossing the bridge one night after, his car suddenly cut out. He said that he heard 13 knocks on his car, then a hissing noise before suddenly the car just came back to life. Locals say that this is the spirit of the 13th victim, whose body was never recovered. The spirit is still said to haunt those who pass over the bridge, hoping they will be the ones to finally find its body and give them a proper burial. So that they may pass on peacefully. Next up at number 7 now, we have Stony Creek Cemetery. The story goes like this. In 1825, the local caretaker in Stony Creek Cemetery in Adams County made a discovery. At the bottom of a large tree was the body of a young man. It didn't take much to figure out the cause of death, as the man's head was completely missing. Although it's hard to beat that in terms of strangeness, there was one other thing. The crime scene was clean of any blood around this headless body. The police determined the murder must have taken place somewhere else before the perpetrator then dumped the body in the cemetery. Rumors began to spread that the head had not been cut off, but rather ripped off by something extremely powerful. The case remained open and unsolved for many years before entering books of folklore. There are those that say that some nights a misty figure appears under a tree in the cemetery, the ghost of this unidentified man, unable to find peace until his murder is solved. Moving on to number 6 now guys. we have. Patterson Tower. There are a number of theories about the origin of this strange tower, thought to be built by a John D. Patterson many years ago. According to legend, a group of teenagers in the 1960s took refuge in the tower during a thunderstorm. As the storm raged on, a lightning bolt hit the top of the tower. Electricity surged down the metal stair rail and electrocuted two of the teenagers, killing them almost instantly. They say that in the weeks afterwards, you could still see their charred outlines on the tower.
tower wall. Officials blocked off the tower from dark tourists by placing metal plates across the door. Visitors still just ripped them off though to see what was inside. Legend now says that on stormy nights the shadowy spirits of the teenagers who died can be seen in the tower. A bright bolt of lightning will illuminate their ghosts making them glow as if they had just been hit by lightning. When the storm fades so do they. Until the next time. Coming at number 5 now we have Little Sugar Creek. The town of Bellbrook is sometimes referred to as Ohio's Sleepy Hollow because of all the ghostly legends that originated there. A man called James Buckley ran a sawmill there many years ago. He lived in a small cabin and grew his business to great heights becoming the wealthiest man in the town. One night his newfound wealth attracted some robbers. When authorities finally arrived to help him they found Buckley's headless body outside. The murder was never solved. People say the cabin was haunted then by his spirit. Those who ventured there say they have been confronted by a headless ghost, his arms outstretched as if begging for help. In time the sawmill was demolished but that didn't bring an end to the sightings. Locals still say that if you wander down to Little Sugar Creek where the sawmill once stood you can still see the ghost of James Buckley unable to pass on peacefully while the case of his brutal murder has been left cold. Moving on to number 4 now we have Otterbein Cemetery. This one is also known as Blood bloody horseshoe grave. During the 1840s an Ohioan called James Henry was involved with two women at the same time, Rachel Hodge and Mary Angle. He wanted to know which one to marry. One night while riding home he fell asleep on his horse. He awoke to find his horse had not taken him home but had instead stopped in front of Mary Angle's house. He took this as a sign and soon he and Mary were married. As his wedding gift to her he gave her the horse that brought them together. They lived happily but in 1840s Mary died from one of the many prevalent diseases at the time. She was buried in Otterbein Cemetery. Henry began courting Rachel Hodge and eventually the two were married. He gave her the same horse as a wedding gift. They hadn't been married long before locals noticed something strange about Mary's tombstone. There was a glowing outline of a horseshoe on it. James took this as a sign that Mary was displeased with his new marriage. They said he was cursed. One night witnesses heard strange noises and lights coming from the cemetery. The next Next morning James was found dead in his barn with the mark of a horseshoe on his forehead. His death was ruled an accident as Henry had been alone in the barn at the time. All alone except for one other creature a horse. Even today they say a strange horseshoe mark is still visible on Mary's tombstone and that on some nights you can hear the sound of hooves trotting up the cemetery road. Moving on to number 3 now we have Buxton Inn. This place has been going since 1812 making it one of the oldest inns in Ohio. In the mid 1800s Major Buxton after whom the inn was named took control of the inn. There have been reports of ghosts there ever since. Many of the ghosts alleged to haunt the inn are said to be of previous owners. However there's also strange knockings people have heard coming from the basement where the stagecoach drivers would have stayed. The door to that same basement is known to open and close by itself and there have even been reports of footsteps coming up and down the stairs there. Major Buxton's spirit is said to be a shadowy figure often sighted in the dining room. Another owner Orin Granger appears as an elderly woman wearing old fashioned breeches who is said to steal pies from the kitchen. There's also the lady in blue who died in the inn and is recognisable by her distinct perfume. There's even a phantom cat that enters people's rooms at night in much the same way it did when it was alive. Next up at number 2 now we have Old Raridan. The story goes that as European settlers first began to arrive in the Ohio Valley wolf attacks on livestock became more and more frequent. Farmers began to hunt down the wolves possibly to the point of extinction but none of them could have predicted what came next. One wolf in particular always managed to escape the farmers. A huge grey one became known as Old Raridan. Farmers often reported seeing him and his mate wandering through the woods Woods, but they never could corner him. Eventually they became the only wolves that remained. One night the wolves were trapped with their backs against Big Rock, a famous landmark. The hunters opened fire and brought the female down. Just as the hunters set their dogs loose to finish her off, a loud cry echoed through the woods. Old Raridan leapt in front and fought the dogs off. The hunters opened fire and wounded him too. Eventually they called off their dogs. Old Raridan dragged his now dead mate up to the top of Big Rock. Once there, 
he let out a thunderous howl across the backdrop of the moon and then slumped down beside his mate. All was quiet, but not forever. On certain nights, locals say you can still hear a painful howl and that if you head to the top of Big Rock, you'll be faced with the ghost of old Raridan, still ready to fight in his afterlife. And finally, number one now, we have the Bloody Bridge. Sometimes you can just tell from these titles where these stories are heading. This bridge lies just outside of Spencerville, crossing the Miami Erie Canal. According to legend, the bridge was the site of a grisly murder in 1854. In the years before that, a rivalry grew between two local men, Bill Jones and Jack Billings. Both had fallen for a woman called Minnie Warren. In the end, Minnie chose Jack, sending Bill into a fit of rage. One night in 1854, Minnie and Jack began to cross the bridge on their way home from a party. At the other end, though, stood Bill. He was holding an axe. They didn't have time to run. Bill took one swing and severed Jack's head clean off. Minnie screamed and jumped off the bridge and into her watery grave. Bill then disappeared until his skeleton was found years later in a well. Was it suicide or revenge from the couple's family? Either way, the years since then have seen reports of ghostly images of the murder couple on the bridge. Some even say that when the water gets dark enough, you can look over the bridge and see Minnie Warren's face staring right back at you in horror. And we're gonna kick off the list with the legend of the Hook Man. Now, supposedly on Pond Run Road in the village of New Richmond, there once lived a doctor and his wife. They had a son who was mentally disturbed, and these two were ashamed of him and opted to keep him out of the public eye. This meant chaining him up in the basement whenever people were over or when they just didn't want him in their presence. One night, there was a terrible storm. A bolt of lightning hit their house and a fire started. When authorities arrived on the scene, they found the parents burnt to death, which was the perfect outcome for despicable people like that. But the boy who had been chained up in the basement at the time was nowhere to be found aside from his hand, still chained up to the wall in the basement. So where did he go? Well, legends started to spread that over the years he grew up stalking through the woods, stealing from homes nearby, brandishing a hook for a hand, and brutalizing innocent people, especially young couples. The urban legend of the hook man is one you see all over the place. This is just Ohio's specific version of the tale. If you're liking our channel uh, so far, by the way, if you're new here, why not hit that subscribe button? You got nothing to lose. It's free. We got awesome videos coming at you on the daily. All right, next on the list, we have Munchkinland. This urban legend of uh, Munchkinland, also known as Tiny Town in Cincinnati, Ohio, centers around a peculiar area near Rumkey Landfill. Here, a cluster of small houses and buildings allegedly housed a community of little people. According to local lore, these tiny inhabitants were notorious for hurling rocks at passing cars, attempting to deter any intruders. Numerous tales circulated about unsuspecting individuals who stopped their cars in the vicinity, only to find themselves confronted by enraged little folk armed with rocks and ready to defend their territory. As to where these little people are said to have come from, the legend goes that they were retired circus performers. Now, there actually was a collection of small structures in this area. They've recently been torn down, I believe. But as to why they were there, there are lots of different stories, including, of course, that they were built by the little retired circus performers. A more likely explanation, though, is that they had been built by a farmer on the land who had decided he wanted to start running hayrides and uh, that he you know, built the houses on the property. But I think it's still a bit murky as to how they got there. Number eight, the Peninsula Python. So this incident involved the discovery of a large python in the Cuyahoga Valley National Park in Peninsula, Ohio in the summer of 1944. The question obviously was, how did this python native to tropical regions end up in a park in Ohio? Uh, for a while, authorities didn't even think the reports were real. Or at least they didn't think uh, people were really seeing what they thought they were seeing. A massive snake stalking the area became something of an urban legend at the time, but turns out that there indeed was a python, and as to how it got there, some believed that it had been a pet released by its owner, others speculated that it had escaped from a traveling circus or a private exotic animal collection. It's still a bit of a mystery to this day as to how it really got there. The python was never even found. It likely died during the winter, but some say it's uh, still stalking its way out there. At number seven, 
We have Gore Orphanage. Light of Hope Orphanage was established in 1902. It was run by a religious zealot. One day the building caught fire and the young ones inside all perished in the flames, the cries for help being unheard. The question was, how did the fire start? Well, some say it was an accident, maybe one of the orphans dropped a lamp, but then there's the legend of Old Man Gore, the cruel, sadistic man who ran the facility. In reality, the man's name was Johann Sprunger. A he ran the orphanage with his wife Katarina. It was actually a former orphanage they ran that caught on fire. It was true that they were cruel though. Orphans attempted escaping from the institution on a number of occasions. There was also a fire in an elementary school in the nearby town of Collinwood where 176 young people died. So most likely these two real life incidents were combined and kind of formed this urban legend that is Gore Orphanage. Next on the list, we have the disappearance of Brian Schaefer. In 2006, Brian Schaefer, a medical student at Ohio State University, completely vanished. On the night of March 31st, Schaefer went out with friends to the Ugly Tuna Saloon, a bar near the campus in Columbus. Surveillance footage captured him entering the bar, but never showed him actually leaving. When his friends realized he was missing, they figured he'd gone home, but he hadn't. And surveillance footage from the bar showed footage of Brian speaking with two women outside the bar just before 2 a.m. His friends had already left at this point. Then he went back inside and that was it. No trace of him after that. And here's the thing, the bar only had one entrance monitored by surveillance cameras, which didn't record Brian leaving. On top of that, there were no signs of foul play in his apartment. Over the years, there's been lots of speculation as to what happened here, but one theory is that he voluntarily disappeared and is alive, hopefully anyway, living with a new identity. At our number five spot, we have Amy. On Lick Road, just outside of Cincinnati, a terrible incident is said to have taken place. A woman named Amy lost her life at the hands of someone, but the perpetrator was never found. The prevailing theory is that her boyfriend did it though. As the years passed, tales of Amy's ghost haunting Lick Road began to spread, making the ghost of Amy one of the most prominent urban legends in Ohio. Supposedly, there are a couple ways to experience the ghost of Amy. One legend goes that if you flick your headlights onto the sign as you're turning on to Lick Road at night, you can see the name Amy briefly flash on the sign. Another goes that if you park your car at the cul-de-sac facing the woods, then flash your headlights three times, your windows will start to fog up with the word help being written in the condensation. Some nightly visitors have claimed to see the ghostly figure of Amy standing at the edge of the forest. Others claim to hear disembodied footsteps behind them as they make their way across the bridge. Next up, we have Satan's Hollow. In Cincinnati, there is a famous drainage tunnel, a tunnel with a very dark history. Strange and ominous things are said to have happened there. Satanic rituals and disappearances supposedly plague the tunnel. And one story goes that during one of these rituals, a portal to the underworld was accidentally opened. This has led to a number of locals believing this series of uh, interconnected tunnels are actually a portal to hell itself now. People claim to hear strange noises coming from its depths and have even witnessed a shadowy figure known as the Shadow Man, a demonic entity who stalks the tunnel at night. The Werewolf of Defiance. So in the summer of 1972, the small town of Defiance, Ohio was rocked by a series of bizarre and terrifying encounters with what locals would describe as the Werewolf of Defiance. First reported sighting occurred when two railroad workers, Ted Davis and Tom Jones, were laboring on the Norfolk and Western Railway. Ted Davis, busy with his work, suddenly looked up to witness something completely unexplainable, a large wolf-like creature clutching a wooden board in its paws. The creature then just whacked Ted on the shoulder with the board before vanishing into the nearby bushes. I like the imagery of that, just a werewolf come walking out. Bam! All right, goodbye. Anyway, five days later, Ted and Tom uh, returned to work, hoping that the strange encounter was just a one-time event. But unfortunately, they spotted this pesky werewolf again. Luckily, it was much further away this time, and uh, they just booked it out of there. They reported the incidents to the local police, and before long, this wave of similar reports flooded in from various parts of Defiance. More and more residents claimed to have encountered a wolf man-like creature. People were scared to go outside. Like nobody wants to be gored by a massive sized wolf person. The sightings, they did trail off, but the wolf man of defiance has remained a legend 
of Ohio ever since. And at second place, we have the Crosswick Monster. This incident took place in 1982 and has become a prominent tale in Ohio's cryptid folklore. According to this story, two young boys, Ed and Joe Lynch, encountered a terrifying creature in a field. They heard peculiar noises coming from the tall grass, and before they could react, a massive four-legged lizard-like beast emerged. The creature swiftly approached them, grabbing 13-year-old Ed in its jaws, and began dragging him towards a hollowed-out tree. Fortunately, though, the boy's screams caught the attention of three nearby men who rushed in to help. They managed to rescue Ed, but he sustained some pretty severe injuries. In response to this initial attack, a group of 60 men armed themselves with axes and clubs, and I'm imagining torches, and they formed a posse to hunt down this creature. They managed to catch up with it, and at one point it stood up on its hind legs. The chase led them to a hill of rocks where the creature vanished into a hole never to be seen again. The story was written up in the local paper at the time, and it's since grown to be a staple of Ohio's folklore. Just what the hell was the thing that they saw that day? And finally, at a number one spot, we have the Circleville Writer. The Circleville Letters case, which began in 1976 in Circleville, Ohio. Is it Circleville or Circle? Cir Solville, let me know in the comments. Anyway, it's still one of the most perplexing unsolved mysteries in the state. It all began with these anonymous, threatening letters sent to numerous residents. The letters contained detailed personal information about the recipients' lives, leading to this fear and paranoia throughout the community. The mysterious writer knew intimate details about the victims' private lives and warned them to cease certain behaviors. One of the primary recipients, Mary Gillespie, was uh, particularly targeted. The sender claimed she had been having an affair, which Mary insisted was not true, and the situation escalated when Mary's husband, Ron Gillespie, received a letter warning him that he would be unalived. The case took a tragic turn when Ron Gillespie was found dead in his crashed car. His death was ruled an accident, but many suspected foul play. The letters persisted even after Ron's death, leaving the town baffled about the identity of the sender. Several theories emerged, including suspicions about a local school superintendent and, and Mary's brother-in-law, but no conclusive evidence was ever found, leaving the case unsolved. This incident has inspired numerous legends and conspiracy theories. Stories have spread about the letters having been written by some sort of uh, vengeful ghost or spirit haunting the town, even. Starting us off at number 10 is Thomas Comberger. In June of 2022, Thomas Comberger, who was reportedly locked away on drug charges, escaped the Star Community Justice Center along with three other inmates and has not been found since. But according to the sheriff on the case, the escapees had some help on the outside in order to execute their plan. One of the other inmates, Jeffrey Fields, was engaged to a woman named Ali Angelo. And it is believed that she, along with her ex-husband, visited the center during the inmates' recreational time and snuck in wire cutters to help the four men, one of whom was her fiancé, escape. Apparently when the cops first arrived at the prison, after they got news of the escape, Escape, they ran into Allie and asked her if she'd witnessed anything, but of course she lied and said no. However, later after realizing she had matched a description given by an employee, she was detained. Now, thankfully, three of the four men were caught pretty shortly after the incident and sent back to the facility, but Thomas remains at large and is still very much a concern. Coming in at number nine, the flat tire killer. Active between 1975 to 1976, this monster is is believed to be responsible for between 12 to 35 deaths, though the exact number is still unknown. The perpetrator got his name as allegedly he would offer to help women traveling alone who had gotten a flat tire. But unbeknownst to them, it was the attacker who had deflated their tires in the first place. While not all victims followed the same formula, it was certainly the method for his first two. Bodies of the victim 
victims were often found dumped into canals, while their cars were found abandoned miles away. Authorities believe the cause of most of the deaths to have been from drowning, and disgustingly, all were found with signs of being taken advantage of prior to their death as well. Over the years, with no culprits being found for these vicious attacks, some have suggested it could have been the work of the notorious Ted Bundy, but it's merely a theory and has no evidence to back it up. For all we know, the flat tire killer remains on the loose. Coming in at number 8, the Frankfurt Slasher. Between 1985 to 1990, this monster was known to prey upon women in and around Philadelphia. Now, I know Philadelphia is not in Ohio, but as this killer is unidentified, many think he could be responsible for other crimes done in neighboring states. The Frankfurt Slasher was known for being incredibly violent, mutilating his victims' bodies past recognition. What was designed to be on the inside of the body, like organs and muscle tissue, would often end up exposed, and then after having his way with the victims, he would leave them on the street, strategically posed for when the police would find them. Believed to be responsible for the death of nine women, the Frankfurt Slasher targeted specifically white women, usually escorts or women with public history of mental illness. But oddly, the age of his victims ranged from 28 to 68. One man, Leonard Christopher, was convicted of one of the crimes in 1990, but more happened once he was put away, causing concern that they had found the wrong man. Further significant questions have popped up regarding the quality of evidence used to convict Christopher. He apparently did not match witness reports of the white man seen with other victims, leaving many in fear that the Frankfurt Slasher remains uncaught and unidentified. Next up at number 7, the Colonial Parkway Killer. An active criminal between 1986 to 1989, this person specifically targeted couples traveling the Eastern Scenic Parkway late at night. During that time, three couples were found dead and one couple went missing, but it is presumed that they had the same fate. A different couple was found each year, leading authorities to question, was this person only killing once a year, or were those just the ones they found? The cases have received major media coverage, including documentaries, news articles, and TV shows as recent as 2021. But despite having over 130 suspects, the FBI have yet to be able to put a name or face to the crimes. One bizarre piece to the puzzle is that in 2010, a note was discovered in a box taken years earlier from one of the victim's apartments. The note stated she was to meet someone in a blue van at a rest stop, and when state police were asked about this, they claimed that the note had been previously examined. But in 1989, during the time of the crimes, an investigator involved with the case told reporters he was unaware of the existence of the note. To this day, whoever was committing these crimes was never caught and they remain on the run. Coming in at number 6. Dr. No. A lesser known but still just as terrifying criminal is the unidentified killer known under aliases such as Stargazer, Dragon, and Dr. No, and who is thought to be responsible for the death of at least nine, but likely more, Ohio women between 1981 to 1990. While it's been several years since a confirmed attack by Dr. No, during his active years, this monster is thought to have been a truck driver who would lure and escorts over the radio, have his way with them, and then kill them, leaving their lifeless bodies in the ditch on the side of the road. Because of this, it took a while for authorities to even connect the crimes, as bodies were being found in many different, seemingly unconnected places. Terrifyingly, whoever is responsible for these brutal crimes has yet to be found, but hopefully authorities are able to track down this monster sooner rather than later. Coming in at number 5, Michael and Sharon. Sharon Gravel. Prior to 2003, adoptive parents Michael and Sharon Gravel appeared to be a wholesome family. Over the years, they adopted 11 young special needs people, homeschooled them, and from the outside, everything seemed totally normal. But sadly, this couldn't have been further from the truth. As it turns out, their 11 adoptees were subjects of
of awful treatment. When authorities found them, they were being kept in cages, and the victims testified that they were often beaten, starved, and emotionally tortured. For example, inside these cage-like enclosures was reportedly an alarm that would go off any time they tried to leave it, and so they were so terrified of setting it off, they would often soil themselves in the middle of the night rather than risk waking up one of their parents. The trial lasted about two years, and there was a lot of back and forth surrounding the reality of their neglect. Some community members came forward to say they were actually very loving parents, and Sharon and Michael insisted that the cages were actually to protect their adoptees from each other. However, with testimonies from the victims stating otherwise, by 2005 their sentence was decided. The Gravels ended up facing just two years in prison for their deeds, which I mean, I might not know all the details of the case, but if you ask me, it seems like a very small amount of years. Eventually they served their sentence from April of 2009 to March of 2011, and now walk free once more. Coming in at number 4, Jacob Nesbitt. In the little town of Troy, Ohio, Jacob Nesbitt and his wife Frances were the picture perfect power couple. They worked at the same company, which was pretty incredible for the time, and Frances was even the one to purchase the couple's beautiful cottage. Friends often came over for dinner parties and would talk about how happy they seemed, and pretty much from the outside, the pair seemed like an unstoppable force. So when Jacob called his neighbor in a panic one night, saying that someone had bludgeoned and killed his wife, it was an utter blow to the entire community. However, as authorities soon figured out, it was a lot darker than Jacob would have his friends and family believe. Behind closed doors, it seems the picture perfect couple were not so happy after all. Jacob complained that his wife regularly humiliated him, or at least he felt that way, as she was the top earner at the manufacturing company, and this did not sit right with him. Reportedly, she would tease Jacob in regards to her success over his, and eventually, one night, after one sly comment too many, Jacob grabbed a club and whacked her over the head with it until she died. From there, he dragged her lifeless body into the bathtub, then burned the evidence of his crimes before realizing what he had done and calling his neighbor. In 1926, he was sentenced to a life behind bars for his crimes, however, was released only 10 years later and able to walk free. Now, to be fair, that was a long time ago, so I mean, he's probably not around anymore, but still, the whole situation was pretty wild. Coming in at number 3. I-70 killer. You wouldn't think the shopping mall off the highway would be a dangerous place to be or get a job, but in the spring of 1992, it very well could have been. 30 years ago, along the Interstate 70, or I-70, an unidentified man was responsible for the death of six store clerks who all had the same things in common. They all worked in a shop off the same highway, they were all brunette with long hair, and they were mostly all women. except. For for one man, but he too had long hair and wore in a ponytail, and police suspect the killer mistook him for a woman from behind. The attacker didn't seem too interested in anything but taking their lives, as he rarely robbed the stores after, and if he did, he would maybe take a hundred bucks. After one of the attacks, a customer walked in the store and caught him, the two victims on the floor, and the attacker still with the weapon in his hand. But fearing for his life, he ran ran away as fast as he could, and in shock, didn't call authorities until nearly an hour later, well after the man had escaped the scene. A few years later in 1994 Texas, two similar attacks took place, and again in 2001 Indiana. The cases have been featured on America's Most Wanted, Unsolved Mysteries, and Dark Minds, but the man has never been caught and remains walking among us to this day. Coming in at number 2, The Cleveland Torso Killer. Once again, another terrifying killer who has never been brought to justice is the Cleveland Torso Killer. Starting in the 1930s, horrifying crime sites began scattering across the city, each as bone chilling as the last. Whoever this monster was had a 
sick mind, as each victim was always found the same, decapitated, plus most of them were also largely dismembered too. During the investigation, the convict enjoyed taunting the detective on his case, once leaving the bloody remains of two victims in full view of his office at City Hall, and at other times would provoke him by sending gruesome postcards. Now, as this monster was never identified, it's not ever been completely confirmed just how many people they hurt. However, the number is thought to be anywhere from 12 to 40, and of the 12 they were able to assure were the work of the torso killer, only three were able to be concretely identified due to the absolute wreckage that the killer put the victims through. Now, to be fair, this happened quite some time ago, so the likelihood of this killer being alive is incredibly improbable, but still terrifying nonetheless. And last up in our number one spot, Lester Eubanks. Born in 1943, Lester Eubanks is a terrifying fugitive who escaped prison 50 years ago and has never been tracked down since. Eubanks, who was 22 at the time of his conviction, was originally sentenced to death after killing Mary Ellen Diener in 1966. However, shortly after he was convicted for his brutal crime, his sentence was commuted to life after the Supreme Court ruled against the death penalty in 1970. The following year behind bars, reportedly Eubanks was a model prisoner, and so nearing the Christmas of 1973, he was rewarded with a prison Christmas shopping trip. However, he took advantage of this opportunity and managed to sneak off unnoticed. His disappearance has eluded authorities ever since, so much so that he has even been featured on shows like Unsolved Mysteries, and as of the last year, he is listed on the US Marshals' 15 Most Wanted Fugitives. While he is Escape prison in Ohio. From what authorities have been able to gather, it's suspected he's hiding in LA currently, and they are offering up to $50,000 for anyone with knowledge of his whereabouts. Number 10. Recent Sighting Middletown was shaken by an extraordinary event last month as residents reported witnessing a display of rotating green lights hovering above them. The inexplicable sighting, which occurred around 10.30 p.m., left many in awe and pondering the possibility of extraterrestrial activity. One individual, Caden Little, managed to capture the event on video while on Jerry Couch Boulevard. Caden described his initial reaction as a mix of fear and fascination, exclaiming, I instantly thought like we're under attack by aliens. It was scary. Fortunately, the lights abruptly disappeared without any hostile action, providing some relief. Eyewitnesses, including Bryce Garrick, observed the lights rotating in a clockwise motion before swiftly darting across the sky and vanishing. The bewildering speed at which the lights maneuvered ruled out the possibility of drones, according to Brian Simpson, president of the Cincinnati Astronomical Society. So what was it? Who knows, but my bet is aliens. Number 9. The Coin Incident At 7.30pm on October 18, 1973, American Airlines Flight 21 encountered a UFO near Mansfield, Ohio and reported it. This would be the first of dozens of sightings reported in the area that night. However, the most astonishing one took place three hours later and became known as the Coin Incident. Sometime after 10.30pm, an Army Reserve helicopter piloted by Captain Lawrence Coyne and a crew of three men was flying from Columbus to Cleveland when some Somewhere around Mansfield, they noticed a red light on the horizon. They then realized that the object was heading straight for them at a high rate of speed. Coin quickly descended to avoid collision, but as the men were preparing for impact, the object came to a halt in front of them and projected a green, pyramid shaped beam over the helicopter. At the same time this was happening, the men reported the helicopter being pulled up and towards the UFO. However, it then let go and darted out of sight. The incident lasted five minutes. The men described a grey metallic looking dome shaped object with a red light on one end and white light on the other. Now interestingly, after the incident, according to one crew member, the helicopter never worked right again. Now this whole incident was seen from the ground by a mother and her two children who pulled their car over to watch what was going on. They reported seeing the helicopter chasing an object that they said looked like limp, paired shaped and as big as a school bus. Number 8. Earliest Photographs 
A photo taken in St. Paris, Champaign County in 1932 is considered one of the earliest possible photographs of a UFO ever recorded. It shows George Sutton, a local resident, in what appears to be a classic UFO shaped object over his left shoulder. Skeptics say the object is simply a street lamp, but according to the folklore that surrounds this image, there were no electric street lights along this road in 1932, nor are any wires or poles visible in the image. Now, this photo is intriguing because it predates the flying saucer craze of the late 1940s and 50s. It was taken before the alleged Roswell UFO crash in 1947, and it was six years prior to the broadcast of The War of the Worlds in 1938, when some people believed aliens were attacking Earth. In other words, the person who took this photograph either captured a street lamp, a real UFO, or was way ahead of the curve in terms of pulling off a good hoax. But I'd like to think it's a real UFO. Number 7. The Carnival as a way to raise money, Father Gregory Miller decided to host a carnival in August of 1949. The church sought help from Sergeant Donald R. Berger, and on the first night of the carnival, sometime after 8 p.m., he was operating the searchlight when it came upon a massive object in the sky. His log states the object was stationary, appearing as a glowing disc. When I moved the searchlight away, the disc continued to glow. He estimated the object to be around 25,000 feet high and reported that the sky was clear with a thin haze at altitude. More than 100 people saw the object that night, including Father Miller. Maybe nothing more would have come from this incident, but the next day, local newspapers carried stories about strange lights being reported all over Cincinnati, not just at the carnival. At least three major newspapers in the area ran stories about the sighting, so it definitely was something. Number 6. 86 Mile Police Chase in Portage Country in 1966, law enforcement officers from several jurisdictions either witnessed or chased a UFO for 86 miles into Pennsylvania. The incident is considered one of the most thoroughly documented UFO cases on record. Portage County Sheriff Deputy Dale Sparr and second deputy named Wilbur Neff came upon the UFO around 5.30 a.m. on April 17th. They were investigating an abandoned vehicle and they heard a humming or buzzing noise behind them and they turned to see a UFO hovering just above a nearby tree. Line. A bright cone shaped light came from beneath the object, illuminating the ground. They called into dispatch, which told them to keep an eye on the object. Just then, the object began to quickly move away. The two decided to give chase, and near the state line, a local police officer saw the object, followed by Spur and Neff chasing it. He decided to join in on the action. However, a short time later, just as the sun was rising, Spur began to run out of gas, so he and Neff and the local police officer pulled into a gas station where they watched the object ascend several thousand feet into the sky and then straight into outer space and well that was that number 5 october 11th 1973 October 11th was quite the night for Ohio residents as there were many UFO spotted. In Dayton, at least 15 sightings were reported. Many witnesses reported seeing objects covered with red, green, and blue lights hovering over treetops in the area. A Montgomery County Sheriff's deputy reported seeing an oblong object covered with lights that appeared stationary in the sky at treetop level for several minutes until he tried to shine his cruiser spotlight on it. It then zoomed towards him and then shot straight up in the sky. Then in Troy, according to an article in the Columbus Dispatch from October 12, 1973, titled UFO Reports Proceed Boom on October 11th, Troy Patrolman Early Thomas and about 100 Troy residents said they watched a hovering red, green, and white object move across the southeastern sky. Now, just to note, this happens to be the direction of Wright Patterson. About 15 minutes later, law enforcement agencies in Miami, Champaign, and Logan counties received hundreds of telephone calls after a sonic boom was heard. They received more calls when a second sonic boom was heard just after midnight, and it seems like the aliens had something special planned for that day to me. <laughs> Number 4. Trumbull County UFO Incident Featured on the History Channel and numerous UFO documentaries, the Trumbull County UFO Incident in Northeast Ohio is exceptional because it was witnessed by numerous police officers and a 911 dispatcher, all of whom were being recorded as they spoke back and forth about the strange events unfolding the evening of December 14, 1994. It was also seen by many members of the public as well. Now, around midnight, Trumbull County 911 began receiving calls from residents about strange low-flying 
flying lights in the sky. The dispatcher sent out Liberty Townsman police officers to investigate. One of them was Sergeant Toby Melro, who saw a light. He got out of his car and looked up to see what he described as a giant circular shaped object and intensely bright in the center section. It made no sound at all. The object was there for about 30 seconds before moving away. Shaken, Sergeant Melro decided to chase the object, as did many other police officers in the area. At least 14 law enforcement officers saw the object that night, with all of them discussing it openly on their radios. Number 3, 1973. There were many UFO sightings in 1973 in Ohio and its surrounding states. For example, in Columbus on September 30th, a Franklin County man claims to have discovered a landing site near his home after seeing a strange object in the sky. Weeds at the alleged site are crushed to the ground in a semi oval area 20 by 30 feet wide. The man says the object whooped down in a zigzag pattern and dropped below the trees. There are several dozen sightings of strange objects in the sky reported in the area that night. Then in Middletown on October 7th, a giant orange colored cigar shaped object with five discs following it and making no sound is reported flying over the city at 10 p.m. Many people see it and Wright Patterson receives numerous calls. Now these are just two examples of that year, but there are many, many more. Number two, Circleville. On August 26, 2022, Pete Hartinger said UFOs were spotted in the area. An expert on the topic who has seen a UFO with his own eyes, Pete said several people reported seeing UFOs between 9 p.m. and 11 p.m., including a man who saw something in the sky as he was traveling on US 23 north of Circleville. He saw strange lights and going on down, he saw some more strange lights. He knows some other people who saw them too, he said. The man said it wasn't right the way the lights were acting. The lights came down, hit the ground, and went back up. So forget about them being flares. Pete said the man, who wishes to remain anonymous, reported what he saw to the Roundtown UFO Society, a local group dedicated to studying these matters. Anybody who has seen strange, mysterious lights that have been in the sky, please let us know, he said. He said at least half a dozen people saw the lights. One person said they saw orange lights over the fairgrounds, he said, and another person said he saw some military aircraft coming in after he saw those lights. Were they coming in to investigate, or what? Since 1947, there have been several sightings of UFOs in the Circleville area, which is strange. And coming in at number one is Ohio is a beacon. According to the Mutual UFO Network of Ohio, MUFIN, the state ranks among the top 10 states in UFO reports. Thomas Wortman with the MUFIN said, It's all sorts of things we get. We get the individual who is out walking their dog at night who reports seeing unusual lights that they just can't explain. They see the lights for a few seconds or minutes and they just want an answer. Now, the majority of these reports come from Northeast Ohio, and Thomas says about 80% of what comes in the agency can be explained. Explained, but about 20% and up being classified as UFOs. Now, if you're waiting for the government to admit that aliens do exist, don't hold your breath because the time reports that the Pentagon isn't going to say that. But my question is, what is so special about Ohio? And we're kicking off this list with a, a very recent Ohio Bigfoot report. This one is detailed on the BFRO or the Bigfoot Field Researchers website, where there are tons of different eyewitness reports of the elusive beast, but this is a good one to start off with because it just happened back in January of this year. On January 22nd on a snowy afternoon in Warren County, Ohio, a family reported seeing a big creature standing near a bike path while they were driving down the road. The father of the family wrote, As we were driving along State Route 350 towards State Route 123, south of Oregonia, we came to the Loveland Bike Trail that runs next to the Little Miami River. As I slowed down near the bike path crossing, we looked out the passenger side of the car and saw a large black figure standing a distance up the bike path facing the river while it was snowing. The ground was covered with at least three inches of snow, so it didn't appear that someone would be on the bike path biking or walking the trail. The weather was not ideal for anyone to be hunting or walking on the path at the time. The figure appeared to have come from the woods and was walking towards the river. He also described the figure as having no obvious clothing pattern, being consistently dark, and that his wife and two teenage children also spotted it. There have apparently been at least nine credible sightings of a supposed Bigfoot-like creature in the same area, too. Number nine, Bigfoot howls. In this video uploaded by We Do It Outdoors, we see our cameraman 
roaming through a forest in Lower City, Ohio. The sun is starting to set and we hear a series of strange eerie howls and tree knocks. We Do It Outdoors seems to have started as a channel about maintaining lawns, but uh, over the last few years, there have been a number of Bigfoot related videos uploaded on there. One of which I may or may not be discussing later in the list. And whether they're real or not, some of them are pretty entertaining. We get some genuinely creepy sounds in this video. It definitely sounds like something or someone is howling in the distance. If I heard sounds like this while I was in the forest, I'd, I'd just turn right around immediately. This guy sticks around until it's like fully dark, and the sounds just get louder and louder. Real or not, it's definitely a creepy video. Number eight, the Jefferson County report. Next up, I have another report detailed on the Bigfoot Field Researchers website. This incident was reported in July of 2021, still pretty recent, in Jefferson County, Ohio. A man describes finding a large footprint in his chicken coop, as well as all of his chickens having gone missing. He's quoted saying, on July 9th at approximately 10 a.m., I noticed my five chickens were missing. The chicken coop was full of feathers, but no bodies or blood. I did a perimeter check and came across an extremely large footprint. I went back to the house and brought down a tape measure to the footprint and measured it and took pictures with the tape measure beside it. The footprint measured a length that was apparently 18 inches with a width of about 9 to 10 inches. A, a Bigfoot investigator named Jim Thompson came to investigate the man's property and discovered more footprints that were about 4 feet apart from one another. That's about double the gait of an average person, by the way. On July 24th, a couple weeks after making his initial report, the man described hearing strange strange yelps coming from either end of his property as if they were yelping back and forth to each other. And he also said that on some nights he gets an eerie feeling that something is watching him. I have that almost every night too. At number seven, we have Susan Ferenczak. Susan Ferenczak is a former skeptic turned Bigfoot enthusiast. After spotting a strange hairy creature near her home in Loudonville, Ohio, she had first spotted what she described as a big black furred creature jump over the road. Not sure where said road was exactly or what type of road it was. If it was a highway road, that would be nuts. If it was just a small dirt road, still scary, not quite as impressive though. Suzanne has recorded audio of what she believes to be a Sasquatch while out in the wilderness near her home and has shared the two minute clip online. I give it a listen. The quality, not great, but it's, uh, it's definitely eerie. You hear this distant howling. It definitely doesn't sound like a wolf. You also get some classic, you know, whoops in there too, which a lot of Bigfoot researchers describe Sasquatches, you know, making. Whether it's a genuine uh, Bigfoot or not, I really just dig supposed Bigfoot audio. I, I just imagine being out alone in the woods at night and hearing some distant wail and whooping and humor or not. I mean, it would it'd be pretty bone chilling. All right, now I'm gonna share the last report from the Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization, at least for this video anyway. There are tons on the site. This one was reported in Mahoning County, Ohio in July of 2021. Sorry if I'm messing up the pronunciation there. A man had described seeing a strange creature one evening after returning home with his wife and is quoted as saying, tonight, yet another sighting by our pond. My wife and I were at dinner and as we arrived home about 30 p.m. A large, fast, gray and silver, light brown, covered in fur, Bigfoot darted from the bushes in our front into the cattails in our pond on all fours. We both looked at each other and said, did you just see that? The subject was down low and bent in the middle as, as it moved. Unlike a dog, its undulating movement was not as fluid as a dog. It was not a bear. It appeared to be from four to five feet at the back and torso built like a barrel. When it went into the cattails, we were no longer able to see it. Number five, the 1992 Grassman sighting. Grassman uh, is again the name often given to the big ape-like creature or creatures that so many Ohio locals have spotted. And in this video, taken in Eastern Ohio in 1992 by a man named Don Keating, he had spotted what looked like a large hairy creature walking into the forest. He managed to capture it on camera. And though the footage is very grainy and it was a fair distance away from it, there is definitely something, something walking into the forest. It's, it's not the most convincing video evidence. It's hard to tell what you're looking at, but I do always find 
find uh, something eerie about old 90s VHS footage, and Keating seems to believe he saw some kind of large cryptid, so. This video was featured on Monster Quest and features an interview with Keating describing what he saw and that he was a skeptic before this encounter. I always like it when they say they were skeptics before, because, you know, it's just, it's a bit more convincing that way. At number four, we have the famous Minerva monster case. Back in 1978, a family living in Minerva, Ohio, reported what they believed to be a large Bigfoot esque cryptid around their home. The Caton family reported rocks being thrown at their home by the creature and would spot large footprints in their backyard. But there are other reports of a mysterious creature in the area around the same time. The Caton's neighbor also spotted the big hairy creature, as well as other residents of the area. The case became known as the Minerva Monster Case and gained rather significant media attention at the time. A former Stark County Sheriff named Jim Shannon, who had responded to one of the Caton family's uh, reports, is quoted as saying, They were terrified. I will always believe them. They saw something. It's just what did they see? This case has become the subject of a 2015 documentary called Minerva Monster, directed by Seth Breedlove, who we might be talking about in a bit. Next up, we have Mark DeWorth. Mark DeWorth is a Ohio Bigfoot investigator who has collected a fair amount of evidence in the 30 years he's spent on the hunt. He's got footprints, audio recordings, and of course, his first-hand encounter, which was the catalyst for his research. The story is he'd been exploring an old strip mine in search of badger dens, he was followed out by something which soon stood up and looked at him, a big, bipedal, hairy creature. If that happened to me, I would not go looking for the creature again. I would move out of Ohio the next morning, probably. The thought of an eight-foot tall, hairy beast roaming through the woods has always been kind of creepy to me, but having one stare at you in a cave? Imagine looking through a cave thinking all you're gonna see that day is maybe some badgers, and then you're met with an eight-foot tall, hairy ape man glaring at you. Only I'm allowed to find badgers in this cave. Whether the story is true or not, definitely a terrifying image. A video shared by Spectrum News shows Mark talking to several residents of Warren County, Ohio about his experience with this elusive creature, as well as hearing some of their first-hand accounts. He plays an audio recording, which sounds, again, pretty creepy. I love me some Bigfoot audio recordings. Anyway, Mark DeWorth has been interviewed on tons of podcasts discussing his Sasquatch experiences. So uh, seek those out if you're interested. And at number two, we have the Seth Breedlove encounter. Seth Breedlove is a filmmaker who's gone on to shoot a series called The Bigfoot Project, which you can find on a YouTube channel called Small Town Monsters. Before he had his first encounter, Seth described himself as a skeptic. In a YouTube video uploaded by Ed Ballant, Seth recounts the time he first encountered what he believes to be a Bigfoot. Seth had been riding down the countryside of Minerva, Ohio, when he spotted what looked to be a large bipedal creature with brown hair running through a clearing on a hill about 50 yards away. And it was fast, clearing the space in less than a second. One of the things that really stuck out to Seth most was the creature's very noticeable musculature, especially in the bicep area. Listening to uh, Seth talk, he doesn't sound like he genuinely believes what he saw. He doesn't seem like he's making anything up on the spot or anything. Thing. Whether it was indeed the missing link or something more benign, he definitely did see something. And coming in at our number one spot is the salt fork footage. This video, once again, uploaded by the YouTube channel, We Do It Outdoors, is only 10 minutes long, but there's there's a lot going on with this one. Uh, so two men were exploring Salt Fork State Park in Eastern Ohio, and after hearing some strange noises, they happened to capture footage of what looks to be a large bipedal hairy animal. We have a few different pieces of evidence in this video. We have handheld footage of the creature moving through the trees. We have some drone footage, lots of sounds too. It's a very meaty video. Now, could it be a big guy in a suit? Look, it can always be a big guy in a suit, but I gotta say, if it is a suit, it's not a bad one, it's pretty good. It looks like it has some bulk to it. It doesn't look like just one of those generic gorilla suits you can pick up at Spirit Halloween. And what I like here is that the footage is clear. He's not relying on shaking the camera around or making the video extra grainy to try and obscure the image. And just for those reasons alone, I like this video, even if it isn't real. We also hear some vocalizations going on here so like I said, it's just a lot 
happening? Check this one out over at We Do It Outdoors. And we're starting off this list today with the Werewolf of Defiance. It's uh, the summer of 1972. Two railroad workers were hard at work on the Norfolk and Western Railway when all of a sudden, one of them, Ted Davis, looked up to see a large wolf-like creature with a wooden board grasped between its paws, which it then whacked the man in the shoulder with before turning off into the bushes to run away like a like a coward. Five days later, Ted and his co-worker Tom Jones returned to the railway for another day's work, hoping they wouldn't be seeing the big furry monster again. Only they did. Only this time it was a bit of a safe distance away. Not that I'd ever feel a safe distance away from a werewolf, but that's just me. And then they reported the sightings to the police. Right around this time, more and more wolfman sightings began piling in, and locals began to panic about the potential of being mauled by a six foot tall werewolf. Imagine actually like feeling that that was a possibility. Like you're heading out of the grocery store and you're like, damn, like really hope I don't run into a lycanthrope today. That's their life apparently in Ohio. Up next we have the Loveland Frog. This mysterious creature has been reported to have been sighted in Loveland, Ohio. The amphibious creature is said to resemble a bipedal frog standing upright on its hind legs measuring up to four feet tall. Not that big, but pretty big for a frog though. Got leathery skin, webbed fingers and toes, you all know how frogs look. And it's also got those iconic glowing large eyes. The first reported sighting of the Loveland Frog was in 1955 when a man claimed to have seen three of them on the side of the road holding some kind of strange wand like device. Again, only in Ohio would you spot three large frogs practicing magic under a bridge. I, I really gotta visit Ohio sometimes. It just seems like such a fantastical place. Again, Narnia got nothing on Ohio. Anyway, since that initial 1955 sighting, there have been several other ones, including one by a police officer in 1972, who reported seeing a creature fitting the description of the Loveland frog scuttling across the road and then hopping over the guardrail into the Little Miami River. Another officer even claimed to have shot at the creature, but it escaped. Some people believe the Loveland frog is an escaped exotic pet or mutated frog, while others speculate that it is a supernatural type of creature. At number eight on the list, we have Melonheads. The Melonheads are a group of cryptids that have been reported to have been sighted in various locations in Ohio, but are primarily found in the Cleveland suburb of Kirtland. These creatures are said to be small in stature with large bulbous heads and distorted facial features. According to legend, they were the result of an experiment gone wrong in which scientists conducted unethical experiments on or Orphans, resulting in the creation of these strange bobble headed beings. Some variations of the story also claim that the melon heads are the descendants of a family who suffered from a rare genetic disorder, maybe, that you know, caused their heads to grow abnormally large. Some even say they could be of extraterrestrial origin, which, which whatever they are, though, I want to see one. I, I'm telling you, I'm coming to Ohio to go on a full cryptid scavenger hunt, and I'd better see me a, a weird, deformed melon head. And number seven, it's Bessie. The Bessie Lake Monster or the Lake Erie Monster. It's a legendary creature that is said to inhabit Lake Erie. The creature is described as a, a big, similar in appearance to Loch Ness Monster, kind of long necked, humpback, as well as a serpentine kind of dinosaur like body. The first reported sighting of Bessie dates back to 1973 when a duck hunter saw a large serpentine like creature thrashing in the lake and startled by his gunshots. And since then, numerous sightings have been reported over the years. Some eyewitnesses claim to have seen the creature swimming close to their boats or even on the shore, while others have reported hearing strange eerie sounds coming from the water. Despite many attempts to capture or study the creature, there is no concrete evidence of its existence. However, the legend of Bessie persists and many people believe that there is something mysterious lurking beneath the surface of Lake Erie. When it comes, you know, when it comes to creatures that reside in the water, I also, I gotta say, it seems plausible. We don't, we don't spend a lot of time underwater, you know? Lots could be lurking in those murky depths, you never know. Number six, Mothman of Gallia County. Most of us have probably heard of the infamous Mothman, large, 
winged, glowing red eyes. It was first reported in West Virginia in 1966, but one of the most famous sightings of this large flying insect was over the Silver Bridge that connected Point Pleasant, West Virginia to the village of Gallipolis, Ohio. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, but I think it's Gallipolis. This sighting happened just a year after the first reported Mothman sighting, and right around the time when the creature was spotted on the Silver Bridge, it collapsed. And some still believe that this mysterious cryptid was the one responsible. There have also been reported Mothman sightings before other big disasters, which has led some to speculate as to whether Mothman is a bad omen or if it is simply appears as kind of like a warning of impending doom, bad or good. Orange eyes. Now, this is a uh, Sasquatch type creature that could very well be the same type of creature as a couple others we'll be discussing on the list. There are many Sasquatch variations seen throughout Ohio, but this one is famous for, as you, as you could probably imagine, it's got these glowing orange eyes. There have been reports of strange creatures with orange eyes lurking in Ohio, said to reside in the river side cemetery before moving to the woods by Mill Lake. Witnesses described the creature as resembling a large bipedal humanoid with a muscular build and a hunched posture. Its eyes once again seem to emit an otherworldly glow. The creature is reportedly very fast and agile and has been known to vanish into thin air when pursued. Some locals believe that Orange Eyes is a Bigfoot type creature, but there are also those theories that maybe a kind of supernatural being or extraterrestrial entity as well. And number four, we have Dogman. Most Dogman reports come out of Michigan, but there have been sightings in Ohio as well. According to witnesses, the Dogman is a bipedal, wolf-like creature that stands between six and seven feet tall with a muscular build and a snarling, dog-like face. The first reported sightings of the Dogman in Ohio occurred in the late 1980s. Since then, there have been numerous other sightings reported in the state. Witnesses have reported seeing the creature hunting in the woods, stalking prey, and even running across highways at high speeds. Some skeptics believe that the sightings, of course, may be misidentifications of known animals like bears or wolves, while others believe that the Dogman is a real undiscovered species that is yet to be officially documented by science. Number three, the Crosswick Monster. Now, there's only one report of this cryptid, but it's it's quite the entertaining tale. It's like something out of a classic 1950s monster movie or something like that. And it's, it's a pretty famous piece of Ohio cryptid folklore. The story goes that in 1882, two boys, Ed and Joe Lynch, began hearing strange sounds coming from the tall grass of a bush behind them. They were fishing. And then before they had time to think, a large four-legged lizard creature popped out from the bushes and began making its way toward them. The boys tried to make their escape, but it caught the 13-year-old Ed in its mouth and began dragging him towards a large hollowed out tree. Three men had heard the boys screaming and managed to make it to Ed's aid before he was pulled into the tree, although he was badly injured. A group of like about 60 men were formed armed with axes and clubs and they tried to slay the beast but the creature managed to escape, actually standing on its hind legs at one point. It's pretty horrifying. The group chased the creature which retreated into a hole under a large hill of rocks. The creature was never seen again. Described as black and white in color and roughly 12 feet in length. Number two, the Minerva Monster. This has to be one of the most famous Sasquatch sightings in Ohio. In August of 1978, in the village of Minerva, the first sighting of the creature was reported by the Caton family, who had seen a large hairy creature in the gravel pit outside of their property, looking to be about 300 pounds. It soon became known as the Minerva Monster and terrorized the Caton family on more than one occasion. They described seeing it peering through their kitchen window one night, awful, and when police came to investigate, they saw large footprints around their home with a terrible smell lingering in the air. The creature was also reported to have thrown rocks at their home one day, and they even reported seeing two large hairy bipeds on a hill by the strip mine near their property. The family has been adamant about what they saw ever since, and their story has remained consistent. It wasn't just the Catons who had run-ins with the large ape-like creature, though. Other locals began reporting seeing a similar creature in and around the Minerva area around the same time. And that's going to bring us to our number one spot, the Ohio Grassman. There's a, a very good chance 
chance that the Minerva monster and orange eyes are the very same creature I'm describing here as they're all big, all furry, ape-like creatures. Grassman is pretty much Ohio's nickname for Bigfoot, described as a large, hairy, bipedal creature standing between seven and nine feet tall. Grassman is said to have human-like face and a muscular build. Witnesses have reported hearing eerie vocalizations and howls coming from the woods, as well as seeing large footprints that they believe belong to the creature. The first reported sightings of the Ohio Grassman occurred in the late 1800s, but the creature gained widespread attention in the 1970s when multiple sightings were reported in the state. Since then, there have been numerous other sightings reported in the area, while some skeptics dismiss the sightings, of course, as misidentifications of, you know, animals or even hoaxes. Others believe that the Grassman is real and he's an undiscovered species. So, I don't know, what do you think? Mm -hmm.